Americans spend hundreds of billions of dollars on medication each year. To keep up with an ever-growing market, pharmaceutical companies are outsourcing a large number of their clinical trials to clinical research organizations, or CROs. Clinical trials are research studies performed on human subjects, and CROs are big business. The clinical research organization industry is around $30 billion today. The top players are based in the U.S., but they seek participants across the globe. CROs now test drugs and vaccines in more than 115 countries. The outsourcing really has escalated in the last 20 years. There are now 20 times more foreign clinical trials than there were back in 1990. Fault lines travel to India, a growing destination for the industry, to investigate the multinational companies and international organizations involved in clinical trials. With more than a billion people, India has no shortage of potential test subjects. International pharmaceutical companies and CROs say India has a huge population and that is why it is attractive for clinical trials. But what they don't tell you is that India also has huge poverty and a growing gap between rich and poor. And conducting clinical trials within such a context will raise serious ethical issues. Located in the state of Madhya Pradesh in central India, this is Bhopal. The name alone has become synonymous with the most catastrophic industrial disaster in history. Poisonous gas leaked at a pesticide factory belonging to Union Carbide, an American company now owned by Dow Chemical. This is the site where the Union Carbide gas disaster happened in 1984, and the community was traumatized. Thousands of people have died, and hundreds of thousands continue to be affected every day. They have all sorts of chronic diseases. Cancer is a problem, diabetes, the water is contaminated. Now, the U.S. Corporation has built a hospital to treat those who have survived the gas leak, but it's now becoming clear that that hospital has also become a site for clinical trials. Lakshmi and her late husband, Shankar Lal, lived within a few blocks of the factory when the leak happened. Shankar's health never improved. The last time he got sick before passing away in 2008, he went to Bhopal Memorial Hospital and Research Center, the hospital built for the survivors. The pills were Ticagrelor, a medicine for heart attacks and strokes that was being tested for approval in a number of markets, including the U.S. AstraZeneca, the pharmaceutical company that makes the medicine, ran the trial in 43 countries. While there's no evidence linking Shankar's death to the pills, Lakshmi says her family had no idea Shankar was participating in a clinical trial. Lakshmi says she's kept all the papers uh, from the hospital, but one thing she does not have is a consent form. She does have, however, uh, the piece of paper that was given to her when her husband was discharged from Bhopal Memorial Hospital, and on it, it clearly states that one of the medication that he was given is a study drug. In any kind of research, whether it be clinical trial or any other research, the people who are part of the study need to be told, like, look, we did this study, this is what we found, and this is how you or whoever else have contributed to improving this drug. That's never done. The Bhopal clinical trial story surfaced when community workers at the Bhopal Group for Information and Action came across the medical records of some of the survivors showing that drug testing had taken place. <laughs> Satyanath Sarangi moved here immediately following the gas leak to fight for the rights of the survivors. He helped found this clinic and has stayed here ever since. When you combine medical treatment with clinical trials, there's always going to be a problem because there's serious conflict of interest. In many situations, treatment and clinical trial are combined. So this is so essentially we are talking of 
people who have no other option, people with uh, reduced autonomy. More than 100 survivors participated in at least six different clinical trials at the Bhopal Memorial Hospital Center, earning the hospital more than 10 million rupees or 227,000 US dollars. The state banned all testing in public hospitals after the scandal broke. Bhopal Memorial refused to let us film inside. Fault Lines was able to bring in a small camera and speak to one of the doctors who ran the trials. Do you have any consent forms you can show us that are full, filled? Well, why? You can take out the name, but just show us how the procedure of the consent form works. No, I can't show you that because it's the first thing is it is the director's room, and even if it, even if I want, I cannot show you. And first thing is that I don't want to show you. Why? Because it is only open to regulatory body. We just had an inspection for about six days. We had tough time. We have to show them each and everything, each and every paper. They are telling that the consent is not taken. Mm -hmm. But how can you say that I was not aware? Nobody is so much illiterate. Nobody is so much illiterate who doesn't understand what is a consent and what the signatures are. But we found a number of illiterate people who participated in the trials. Ramadhar is 56 years old. He also says that he had um, no idea he was on that clinical trial at Bhopal Memorial. And uh, we are here to hear his story. <laughs> एक कागज है इंग्लिश में मैं तो इंग्लिश जानता नहीं हूँ इंग्लिश में जरूर साइन कराते थे और मेरे को दो डिब्बीं दी थी तीन डिब्बीं मतलब मेरे पास पैसा नहीं नहीं अब तक तो कोर्ट में कहा बाम में फोन जाता बाम का दुनिया में फोन जाता हाई कोर्ट फोन जाता है लेकिन गरीब आदमी है सब अब पैसा कहाँ से लेके आते हैं अपना अपन पैसा लगाएंगे तो बच्चों को हम क्या खिलाएंगे AstraZeneca told fault lines there were cases where consent forms were not properly filled out. It says it doesn't know how many, and it could not confirm whether any follow-up care or compensation was provided to the patients in question. Because we're the industry pioneer, the most trusted names in biopharma have trusted us to help develop or commercialize their products. Another CRO that carried out clinical trials at Bhopal Memorial was Quintiles. We are future, future. Human Health. We are Quintiles. Based in the U.S., Quintiles is considered the largest CRO in the world. An Indian government investigation revealed, quote, deficiencies in one of the clinical trials it conducted. Quintiles refused to confirm with fault lines any details of the investigation. One U.S. company makes people sick, and then the U.S. pharmaceutical companies, which are, have very close ties, if they're not themselves chemical corporations, uh, another U.S. pharmaceutical company comes and tests its drugs. So what, and this, we, we feel as if uh, India is increasingly becoming like a colony of U.S., of U.S. corporations. Back in the U.S., corporations engaged in clinical trials are represented by the Association of Clinical Research Organizations, or ACRO. The group strongly advocates for the globalization of clinical trials claiming they need access to large populations outside of the U.S. in order to create new medicines and vaccines. Doug Petticord is the executive director. He says informed consent or the agreement to participate in a clinical trial should be consistent across countries, be it in India or the United States. Their physician has an ethical and a regulatory responsibility to ensure that their informed consent is a positive and valid one. Does that always happen? It's an issue throughout the world. So you're fully confident that the companies that you represent, the companies that are operating in countries like India, are conducting business to the highest ethical order? I think all of our companies are indeed committed to standards of work that are the same in India as in the U.S. or in Europe. Those standards are supposed to be monitored by the most powerful watchdog in the U.S., the Food and Drug Administration. 
The Department of Health has conducted its own investigation into foreign clinical trials, and I have it here with me. In it, it says that 80% of the drugs that the FDA approved in 2008 had data from foreign clinical trials, but the FDA inspected less than 1% of these sites. This report also says that the FDA could not track all the clinical trials that were taking place because CROs did not register all of them. What you're really talking about, fundamentally, as you say, are that people are fully informed of what's going to happen, that they give a full, free, independent, informed consent to be in there, that they have the right to ask any questions as to what's going on, they have the right to drop out any time they wish without any penalties. I saw firsthand illiterate poor Indians being used in clinical trials when they had no idea what was going on. Well, I think, again, going back, as, as we said at the beginning, in order for us to use the data, it has to be done in accordance with international um, standards. It's not, though. Well, and I think that that's the point, that if, if there is data, if, um, and if we're made aware of that, and if we find out, we simply will not use the data. I think, though, you have to also realize, to, to, to a degree, that what happens in an individual country primarily is under the oversight of that country. Our jurisdiction as the FDA ends at the U.S. border. Uh, Dr. Lumpkin's statements are at the least misleading and at the worst they're a lie and incorrect. Sidney Wolf helped found Public Citizen, a nonprofit consumer interest group based in Washington. The FDA has obviously had jurisdiction to inspect foreign drug manufacturing facilities. Uh, they have inspected foreign clinical trials. Is he saying that they're doing it illegally, or is they re he's really trying to cover up the fact that they haven't been doing enough of it by saying they don't have jurisdiction? The FDA says it's opening offices in a number of countries to train local regulators. They now have 11 of their personnel on the ground in India. If uh, there is an effort made to train uh, and do capacity building, it's a positive thing, but that uh, still does not measure up to the, to the quantity or the amount of problem that we have. Dr. Amar Jasani oversees a medical ethics research center in India. His organization catalogs violations and monitors clinical trials across the country. Unlike, say, in the developed countries, uh, where a uh, lot of safeguards are provided to the people who are in the clinical trial, we don't have those safeguards ensured because the regulatory agencies are almost dysfunctional. They are not able to inspect, they don't have funds, they don't have inspectors, and uh, there's a lot of corruption within the system. CROs and pharmaceutical companies often pay doctors for every participant they sign up. Some Indian doctors say this creates a conflict of interest because doctors are working for both the pharmaceutical companies and their patients. See, a doctor's first duty is towards his patient. It is not towards industrial. Dr. Dilip Maideo used to conduct clinical trials at a private hospital in Mumbai. He decided to stop because of the alleged corruption he says he witnessed. There are stories when uh, kickbacks have taken place earlier in form of, you know, uh, appliances given free of uh, cost to the doctors, uh, even cars being given, and uh, so on and so forth. And uh, uh, moreover, uh, but some uh, sponsorship uh, for, for a non-clinical meeting also. What does you know, that mean? Non-clinical meeting is a meeting which uh, just, you know, go and enjoy. It's, a, it's not a foreign joint, joint uh, which we, you have to necessarily attend a conference also. It is just a holiday that is put, totally sponsored. This was one of the few CROs that allowed us to film an ongoing clinical trial, as long as we do not reveal the identities of the participants. Based in Mumbai, the CRO says for this trial, it pays people per milliliter of blood that they lose. They receive more money when the drugs have serious side effects. Off camera, staff told us that 95% of the participants are poor. The other 5% are university students. One of the reasons that companies go to these other countries is they know 
that the patients are desperate. They have no medical care. Oh, I will gladly experiment with anything because at least I'll get treated. This is not the kind of circumstance that could be described even remotely as informed consent. There's an element of coercion because people are being told, do you want no medical care or are you going to participate in the experiment? Oh, I'll do the experiment because otherwise I'm not going to get anything. For many Indians, health care is out of reach. At least one million people die every year due to a lack of adequate health care. 700 million have no access to specialists. Drug testing in India brings together a complex web of international NGOs and multinational corporations. In order to understand the origins of the next story, you need to begin here, in White House Station, New Jersey, the headquarters of Merck and Company, one of the world's largest pharmaceutical companies with global sales of $46 billion in 2010. In 2006, the FDA licensed Merck's Gardasil, the first vaccine for HPV and cervical cancer prevention. But since Gardasil's launch, sales have steadily declined. From $1.5 billion in 2007 to $988 million in 2010. Before sales began to slump, Merck teamed up with PATH Based in Seattle, Washington, PATH is an international nonprofit organization focused on public health policy. Merck and GlaxoSmithKline, another pharmaceutical company, donated the vaccines to PATH. And with a $27.8 million grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, PATH created what it described as a demonstration project that launched in Peru, Uganda, Vietnam, and India. India has a quarter of the world's cervical cancer. There, PATH vaccinated thousands of young girls to see how the two drugs fare. The goal was to make the vaccine part of India's national health care system. The states of Gujarat and Andhra Pradesh were chosen. Andhra Pradesh is a large agricultural state that hugs the southeast coastline. It's known as the rice bowl of India. Mangoes, hot peppers, and cotton are all grown here. With an estimated population of 80 million, it's India's fifth largest state. Kudumula Venkatama is a farm laborer in a small village in Andhra Pradesh's Khammam district. Her daughter Sarita attended a boarding school a few hours away. She says that when her daughter came home from school for a vacation, something wasn't right. Kudumula wasn't aware at that point that her daughter had been vaccinated as part of the demonstration project. In fact, it wasn't until after her daughter died that she found out. What's the vaccination for? Do you know what is cervix cancer? Now in the death certificate it says that Sarita died on the 21st of January 2010 and a post-mortem was conducted on her a day after and the parents say they've been trying to get a copy of that post-mortem for the last eight months but the hospital wouldn't give it to them. This is the girls' school that Sarita attended. She is one of five girls who received Gardasil in Andhra Pradesh and died later. Here, it was the headmaster and not the parents who provided consent for Sarita and others. An interim government investigation into the subsequent deaths of some of the vaccine recipients concluded that none of the girls died from the vaccine. The causes identified included malaria, drowning, and suicide. 
Local health advocates complained that the investigators neglected to even speak with the parents of the girls who died to get their side of the story. We met other parents who say they too were kept in the dark. Nageshwara and Vengatama lost two daughters who both received Gardasil. They died 25 days apart. The parents were given a consent form for the vaccination, but both of them are illiterate. Why did you sign? Why did you say OK and sign? Merck refused to clarify the terms under which it provided PATH with the free medication. PATH told fault lines neither of the pharmaceutical companies involved designed or funded the study. Both claim that there has never been a single death associated with the vaccine. PATH also says it provided strong guidelines on informed consent and used visuals to help parents understand the project. The pamphlets we saw were heavy on text. The project was suspended by the Indian government just weeks before it was completed. The interim government report concluded that, quote, since there was no malintention, no responsibility can be fixed on one person. For many people involved, that explanation is not enough. If I'm providing vaccine, which is, and, and, and I'm going to benefit from the research that is being carried out, it is my duty, my obligation to find out what exactly is happening. The vaccine was the cause of the entire happening. And their uh, intention to capture the market of the universal immunization in India was the cause of the entire thing. And so they cannot just uh, wash the hands and say that they are no responsibility. No, can't be. The parents of the deceased girls we spoke with say no one has followed up with them since their daughter's deaths. The business of clinical trials is showing no signs that its global expansion is slowing down. The industry is often very secret, citing doctor-patient privilege as the main reason for not sharing information with outsiders. Over the course of our reporting, Fault Lines was routinely denied access to facilities, patient records and interviews with key players. Why such secrecy? What's the motivation behind such secrecy? Business. Because drug industry is drug, everything to do with drug business. I told you that healthcare industry is also a business. It is because the business ethics prevents or business practices prevent you from sharing information. The actions of US pharmaceutical companies at home have already cost them nearly $15 billion in fines over the past five years for violations that include selling drugs that fall short of FDA standards and enticing doctors with perks and financial rewards in exchange for promoting their product. Now, the US Department of Justice is conducting an industry-wide corruption investigation into overseas clinical trials. According to lawyers familiar with the case, there have been high-level discussions within the Department of Justice about payments made by clinical research organizations that violate the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. FBI agents and federal prosecutors are examining payments to assure that foreign officials are not being corrupted or bribed. So if trials are to be conducted, and there cannot be two standards of trial, I mean, if uh, trials are conducted in one way in the, in the US or in the developed countries, the same way, way has to be followed, the same code has to be followed. And here we find very, very clearly uh, a, a racist policy. When we're trying to develop new drugs to treat people, we can look at 350 million people in the United States, or we can look at 7 billion people in the world. The numbers are enormously compelling. The doctors and investigators in the foreign companies are more desperate for money. The people in these foreign countries are more desperate for medical care and for money. The ethical 
oversight of clinical trials in these countries is less than it is in the United States. The idea of there being inspected by the United States government is much less than it would be here. So it's ideal, and I think they are exploiting the third world enormously.